Uh, Dan said I have like two and a half hours for this teaching. Actually, no, we have to note the time. So, um, so yeah, we're going to be covering Nehemiah chapter 4 this morning. And as you make your way to Nehemiah chapter 4, I want to give you a little bit of background before we get into our study. Our study this morning is about the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem, which were destroyed by the Babylonian invasion around 586 B.C. You may not be familiar with that particular date, but you are familiar with what happened at that date. That's when Daniel and his friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were taken by then King Nebuchadnezzar and forced to work in his palace. At that time, God's people were defeated. It had been that way for a long time. And the walls of Jerusalem were destroyed. And there were two people who prophesied the rebuilding of the wall. One of them was Daniel, and the other was Zechariah. There were also multiple attempts to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, but they had failed. That's in Ezra chapter 6. And as a result of the destroyed city, the people were in distress, they were disgraced, and they were only called survivors of this war-torn town or a ghost town. And there were two others that were gifted by God to restore the work of the walls of Jerusalem. One of them was the prophet Zerubbabel, the other one was Ezra. Nehemiah is the third person to come on and attempt to complete the rebuilding of the walls there in Jerusalem. Now, the Jews had been returning and living in this land for approximately 90 years by the time Nehemiah steps in. And in today's passage, in chapters 1 and 2, Nehemiah, who held a fairly high-ranking level government job with the Persian government, was a cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. And upon hearing the condition of the gates, and the walls, and more importantly, the people of Jerusalem, Nehemiah requested permission to return back to Jerusalem and to finish the work. Nehemiah was given favor by the king, and the king tells him to go back and finish and complete the work. To put it in modern-day uh, analogies, basically the king tells him, here, take the jet, here's the Home Depot card, take everything that you need to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. This truly was a, mo a movement by God. And Nehemiah travels some 800 miles back to Jerusalem. And when he gets there, he does an inventory work of, uh, of the work and begins to rally the troops. 800 miles. To give you some perspective, it's about 400 miles from here to San Diego. He goes 800 miles. In chapter 3, he talks about everyone who worked and the roles and the assignments they had and what they did. And there was great significance of rebuilding the walls in Jerusalem. And there were those who did not want the Jews to complete the task of rebuilding the walls. And the main reason for this, you will be shocked, it was political. There was a political agenda aimed at suppressing the Jews from reestablishing their confidence of, of their relationship with the Lord and their understanding of their identity in Him. And so Nehemiah hears of this state he's discouraged he asked the king for permission to go back the king grants him permission gives him his leave and nehemiah embarks on a journey all the way back to jerusalem to finish rebuilding the work uh, of the walls and when he gets there this is what happens we pick it up in verse one of chapter four but it so happened when sam Ballot heard that the rebuilding that they were rebuilding the wall that he was furious and very indignant and mocked the jews and he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish, stones that were burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and said, Whatever they build, even if a fox goes on it, he will break down their stone wall. Verse 4. Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn their reproach on their heads and give them as plunder to the land of captivity. Do not cover their iniquity and do not let their sin be blotted out before you, for they have provoked you to anger before the builders. Verse 6. So we built the wall. The entire wall was joined together up to half of its height, for the people had a mind to work. And now what happened when Samballat, Tobiah, and the Arabs, the Ammonites, the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the gaps were beginning to be closed, that they became very angry. And all of them conspired together to come against and attack Jerusalem and to create confusion. Nevertheless, we made our prayer to our God, and because of them, we set watch against them day and night, verse 10. And then Judah said, the strength of the laborers is failing, and there is so much rubbish that they were not able to build the wall. 
And our adversaries said, they will neither know nor see anything till we come into their midst and kill them and cause the work to cease. Verse 12. And so it was when the Jews who dwelt near to them came that they told us ten times, from whatever place you turn, they will be upon us. Therefore, I positioned men behind the lower parts of the wall and at the openings, and I set people according to their families with their swords and their spears and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the leaders and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord great and awesome and fight for your brethren, your sons and your, your daughters and your wives and your houses. And it happened And when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had brought their plot to nothing, that all of us returned to the wall, everyone to his work, verse 16. So it was from that time on that half of my servants worked at constructions, while the other half held spears and shields and bows and wore armor. And the leaders were behind all of the house of Judah. Those who built on the wall and those who carried burdens loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked at construction and with the other hand they held a weapon, verse 18. Every one of the builders had a sword girded to his side as he built, and the one who sounded the trumpet was beside me. And then I said to the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, the work is great and extensive, and we are separated far from one another. Whenever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally there to us, and our God will fight for us. Verse 21. So we labored in the work, and half of the men held spears from daybreak until stars appeared. At the same time, I also said to the people, let each man and his servant stay at night in Jerusalem, that they, may, that they may be our guard by night and a working party by day. So neither I, my brethren, my servants, or the men of the guard who followed me took off our clothes, except when we took them off for washing. Let's pray. Well, Father, we thank you for the tremendous privilege that you give us to come into this place, to open our Bibles, and more importantly, open up our hearts before you. We ask that, Lord, you would speak to hearts that need to hear from you this morning. Or that you would lift heavy burdens by those who come weighed down by the things of the world. Whatever this week has brought us, whether it's been a week of difficulty and trials or a week of blessing, we ask, God, that you would strengthen us. That we would leave this place just a little different than the way that we came in. That we would evaluate where we're at, that we would look to you. In light of all that is going on over the last few hours, we need to hear from you. We need to receive from you. So we pray that you would quiet our hearts and minds. Holy Spirit, we ask that you have your will your way, that you would strengthen the hands and feet, as it were, of the church, and that we would rise up and shine for you, that we would be that city on a hill that cannot be hidden. So, Father, we commit this time to you. We ask that you would use me to represent you well and to give you the glory. And again, we ask that we would leave this place drawing closer to you. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen, amen. The book of Nehemiah is a continuation of the restorative work that is being done on the walls of Jerusalem, which ultimately would lead to the spiritual revival of the Jews. And the work that Nehemiah was about to embark on was no small task, to say the least. He would be met with obstacles and opposition and with adversaries. Again, in fact, Ezra told us that multiple attempts of the rebuilding of the walls had tried to have been uh, completed, but they had failed. And as a result, the people were in tremendous dis- distress. But despite all that Nehemiah would go through, he paints a powerful picture of what happens to you, what happens to me, when we choose to focus on who our God is rather than the circumstances around us. When we choose to focus on him rather than the circumstances around us. So the question becomes, where is our focus? And in a time when there is a lot that is competing for our attention, the question becomes, how do we maintain an awareness of what is going on in the world around us while keeping our focus and our attention on where it needs to be? How do we maintain an awareness but not allow the circumstances of the world to impact our call, our joy, our mission, and the work that God desires to do in us and through us? You see, for Nehemiah, He was very aware of what was going on in the world around him. 
he held a fairly high-ranking position within the Persian government. He would have been present. He would have been in ears throw away of the intelligence briefings that were going on with the king on a daily or at least on a weekly basis. But his focus was not on the circumstances. His focus wasn't even on the condition of the walls and the people of Jerusalem. His focus was on who his God was and what God was going to do in and through him. And so how do we as the church maintain that kind of perspective? Well, I'm really glad you asked, because in Nehemiah chapter 4, read it with me, verses 1 through 4 again. But it so happened when Samballot heard that we were rebuilding the wall, that he was furious and indignant, and he mocked the Jews, and he spoke before his brethren in the army of Samaria and said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones uh, from the heaps of rubbish, stones that are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him, and he said, Whatever they build, even if a fox goes on it, he will break down their stone wall. Verse 4, Hear, O Israel, sorry, hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn their reproach on their own heads and give them as plunder to the land of captivity. If we are going to maintain the same kind of focus despite the circumstances going around us, we must, we must, we must, listen, become people of prayer. Nehemiah was heartbroken after hearing the state of Jerusalem and the people that he immediately got up and sought the Lord in prayer in chapter 1, echoed in chapter 4. Yes, Nehemiah eventually got up and he took action and, and, and was doing something, but he first and foremost sought the face of God in prayer. Never has that been more true than today. Nehemiah's focus and confidence came as he spent time with God, as he prayed to the Lord. Do we do that? Or are we quick to jump to conclusions? Are we quick to jump to the latest headlines? Or are we as quick to fall to our knees and to seek the face of God? Again, the question must become, how is your prayer life? It has been said for the believer, when your prayer life is out of order, your life will be out of order. It was Martin Luther who said to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. Our prayer life is to be something that is woven into the fabric of our beings. Now, prayer is a spiritual discipline, but like all disciplines, we may wrestle to stay practiced in. We tell ourselves we're too busy to pray or feel we don't know what to pray for or even how to pray. Maybe our struggle is to believe that our prayers will not go answered or our prayers don't go higher than the ceiling. And as a result, we become discouraged in this spiritual discipline. But even Jesus himself invites us to, quote, seek first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness and all of these things will be added unto you, Matthew 6, 33. What if you knew that your prayers would be answered? What if you knew that with 100% certainty? Would that change the way that you pray? Would it change the way that you approached God in prayer? Would you find yourself devoting more time to prayer? What if you knew that God would meet every need that you have? Now, we cannot confuse our needs with our wants. The promise that God to answer your prayer is not a promise to answer the request for the new boat or the new Corvette. Not that there's anything wrong with having those, but God's promises are about giving you what you need for His glory. You might need wisdom for a situation, strength to navigate a season, the ability to extend grace or forgiveness, healing in a marriage or a relationship, or the ability to share the gospel with family or friends. God's promises are to give you what you need for His glory. Prayer is not about getting what we want or even getting our answers to all of life's questions. And believe me, all of us in here have them. We have those questions, but it's about aligning ourselves up with His will and getting his answers. Psalm 73 was written by a, a man named Asaph. And if you're familiar with the Psalms, and you know that Asaph 
lived during the time of David, and he was one of David's, essentially he was one of David's worship leaders. And there are some who suggest that at this season in Asaph's life, he had what was equivalent to a crisis of faith. He began to look at the world around him, and he was discouraged. He saw the wicked people prosper, and those that wanted to honor God suffered, and he couldn't reconcile this, and had a difficult time reconciling why In his perspective, wicked people not only prospered, but they didn't have the same problems that we had. He didn't have the same difficulties that the average person had. The the, the wicked were wealthy, they were successful, and they were prospering. But those who wanted to honor God were suffering. And he had such a hard time reconciling this that in chapter 16, excuse me, verse 16 of chapter 73, Asaph said, when I tried to put this together, it deeply troubled me. And in verse 17, he said, until... Until, and I love that, until I entered the sanctuary of God. There is something that happens to you and to me when we humble ourselves and enter into the presence of God, not to get our answers, but to get His. When we go into the presence of God to know Him more, to know what He is doing more, not to try to dictate what the Lord is going to do, but to understand what God is already doing. When we come before the Lord and sit into His presence and soak in His presence, something happens to you and to me. It was true for Asaph, and it was true for Nehemiah. And again, it's true for you and for me. So how often do you and I sit and soak in the presence of God? Nehemiah didn't just pray one time. He didn't just go to the Lord and say, Lord, I just pray for Jerusalem. I pray that you would encourage the hearts of uh, the people there and that you would just do a great work. Amen. He continued to seek the face of God until God moved upon his heart. Then Nehemiah responded to that. He continued to pray, and he prayed through what appeared to be absolutely impossible by all outside perspectives. He prayed through the opposition. He prayed through the distractions. He prayed and he trusted God that God would see him, that God would see them through. Oh, that you and I would understand the power that God has given us through prayer. It was Oswald Chambers who said, prayer does not equip us for the greater works. Prayer is the greater work. Many, uh, actually, not many years ago now, about eight years ago now, um, my wife and I lost our first pregnancy to a miscarriage. And when you go through that, you begin to ask questions, right? Naturally, you begin to ask questions, and, and naturally, the question of why becomes the forefront. Was there something that we didn't do right? Was I not spiritual enough? Was I not praying enough? Was I not doing all the things that the Lord was calling me to do? We became pretty discouraged. And right after that, I just felt the Lord lay upon my heart to begin to seek Him. And so I went to my wife and I said, hey, what do you think about uh, getting together on one day out of the week? And let's just, let's just really just dive into the scriptures and to see what God's going to do. And she said, sure, um, where do you want to read? And I'm, I have no idea where I want to read. And where do you start? Is there a bad place to start when you read the Bible together? And so, uh, again, just felt led to read the story of First Samuel. First Samuel came in, into, uh, into our hearts and minds. The very first time we got together, we began to read First Samuel chapter 1. If you're familiar with First Samuel chapter 1, it's a story of a woman named Hannah, who goes to the temple of the Lord because she had been praying and praying and praying and praying for a son. And she was so distraught that she could not have a son that when she finds herself in 1 Samuel chapter 1, on the steps, crying out to God that Eli, the priest who was there, who heard the commotion, goes outside, sees this woman, and assumes she was drunk. And rebukes her. And Hannah gets up and she says, I'm not drunk. Okay? I'm just seeking the Lord and I want God to answer my prayers and I'm praying for a son. And no doubt, um, that was quite embarrassing for Eli. And so he says, oh, I'm sorry. Um, 
may, may God give you what you want at that point, which is his way of saying, oops, my bad, I thought you were drunk. And she begins to pray and to pray and to pray and to pray. In all of chapter one, she prays for God to give her a son. In chapter two, God answers that prayer and gives her a son named Samuel. And if you're familiar with the life of Samuel, he did some tremendous work. I encourage you to read that for homework over the weekend. But as we read that, as with my wife and I, we were moved to just pray, Lord, would you give us a family in your time? And we left it at that. Two weeks later, my wife got pregnant. Well, as you can imagine, we were pretty nervous about going through this a second time. And so paying attention to all the different things, um, we got to a place where, by all accounts, my wife should have been ex experiencing uh, the baby moving in the womb, and she, she wasn't. When we sat down for our next Bible study, she said, I haven't felt the baby move. And me being the God-fearing, faithful person that I am, I immediately went to, all right, tomorrow we're going to make doctor's appointments and we're going to figure this out. And I just felt the Lord... move upon my heart and said, you trusted me at the start of this. Will you not trust me in the middle of this? Humbled, confessed, the Lord will trust you. We'll still make some plans to go to the doctors because part of being informed. Well, we'll trust you in this. No sooner did we finish praying, my wife felt the baby kick for the first time. Now, fast forward a few months after that, when it came time to name our son, we felt that only appropriate to name him Samuel. And so his name is Samuel. Not Sam. If any of you interact with him, Samuel. Now I wish everything that we prayed for every time had this kind of a response. It doesn't. But it's an encouragement to me, and it's an encouragement to my wife every time. Especially now, our, our son's seven now, and he's an absolute terrorist. But <clears throat> when, whenever we get to that point, when we, get, we have to remind ourselves of his testimony, how he came to be. A few years later, he had a younger sister. Her name is Hannah. The point in all of this is that we have to be willing to pray. We have to be willing to seek the Lord in prayer. So what are you facing today? What are you burdened for? Who are you burdened for? Are you praying? Husbands, are you praying for your wives? Wives, are you praying for your husbands? And not, Lord, change him, change her. But Lord, draw him, draw her closer to you. Are you praying for your family? This morning, are you praying for your country? It can be easy, and I don't want to get off on a tangent on this, but it can be easy to look at the circumstances going on in the last 24 hours and run to the news outlets before we had run to the Lord. Are we praying for 
the circumstances. I am reminded this morning and last night, especially for us as Christians, that we are the light to this world. We are the salt of the world. And while I'm as patriotic as I think most, I'm reminded that I can't confuse patriotism for holiness. I'm reminded that one day we're all going to go into eternity. And for those of us who have accepted Christ and follow him, we have the promise of heaven. And I'm reminded that when we get to heaven, the American flag will not be waving in the center of heaven. There will be no nation. There will be one people, God's people. Now, before the comments of anti-patriotism come my way, let me just humbly say that I have taken the oath to protect the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. I am patriotic, but I also realize that there's a greater cause and purpose, and that is to lead people to Christ. We must be willing to pray. We must be willing to seek the face of God in prayer. That's number one. The second thing we must understand is that there is work that needs to be done. Read it with me in verses 5 and 6 of Nehemiah 4. Nehemiah says, Do not cover their iniquity and do not let their sin be blotted out before you, for they have provoked you to anger before the builders. And so we built the wall, and the entire wall was joined together up to half of its height, for the people had a mind to work. Nehemiah was rebuilding walls, but God is in the business of rebuilding lives. Building the wall wasn't the point. It was what the wall represented. That was the point, and that is what Nehemiah was accomplishing. There's a direct connection in their days with the strength of the walls that protected your city and the God of whom that city belonged to. Yes, the walls provided security and protection, but more importantly, in this case, it was used to bring the Jews back to spiritual faithfulness and spiritual revival. There is work that needs to be done, and God desires to use you and desires to use me. He desires to use us in our homes, in our jobs, in the circle of friends, on your team, whatever the case may be. You may see it as an impossible task. You might be overwhelmed by the work, but this is why God said from the very beginning, it is not by power nor by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts, because nothing can change the mind and heart of a person like the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is why our trust is not in the ballot or in a man or worldly government, but our hope and our trust and our belief is rooted in the powerful, redempted work of the cross of Jesus Christ. And God desires to use you wherever you are at, how you are. You might think you might have your own limitations. You might think, well, I'm not measured by the standards of all of these other people. How can God possibly use me? God desires to use, and he will use you. But you and I have to be willing. If we're tired of seeing the communities, our culture in shambles, then listen, it's the church that needs to rise up and shine like that city on a hill that cannot be hidden. Politics isn't going to change culture. In fact, politics is always downstream from culture. If you want to change the culture, then we need to shine bright for Christ. If you want to change the culture, we have to reach the next generation for Christ. We can't expect them to understand the goodness of God and the faithfulness of God. Listen, unless the older generation tells them. It's been said that young people want to be a part of something greater than themselves, and I have to agree with that. Young people are always hungry and thirsty to be a part of something greater than themselves. That is why we see young people so susceptible to causes 
and movements that really have no root and foundation, but it's sprinkled with that taste of this is something greater than me and I will do that. And I would say for us as followers of Christ, there is nothing more important, more impactful, nor nothing more greater than the ability to change someone's eternal destiny and to introduce them to Jesus Christ. There's nothing more encouraging, nothing more moving, nothing more noteworthy than when we get to the place where we introduce someone to Christ and their lives are forever changed. This is why the Bible teaches that all of the angels rejoice in heaven when one sinner comes to repentance. God desires to use you. But the older need to teach the younger. They need to pour out and remind them of the great works of God. And if I may, as someone who's kind of this in-between between the older and next generation, I can tell you the to the older generation, the younger people need to hear and see what it's like to fight for the things of God. To fight in prayer, fight in service, and to stand up for righteousness. There is no greater encouragement, no greater testimony than when you see someone who's about to step into eternity and they do that with dignity Righteousness, hope. The younger generation needs to hear it. And to the younger generation, I would say you need to pay attention to the older generation, especially those who are in the fight serving the Lord. You need to pay attention to them and watch them serving Christ and finishing their race well. The work of the ministry is not limited to just the pastoral staff or the volunteer staff. There are a lot of people who go to church and say, well, I give to the church, I tithe, and that's God using me. Well, I won't take that away from you. That, that might be, but everyone, just like we read in Nehemiah chapter 3 and 4, Everyone has a job. Everyone has a role. Everyone has an assignment. Everyone in this room has a God-given gift and calling, but you will never know that apart from him. And no matter what happens in our world, no matter what happens in the next few months or even years to come, it doesn't change the fact that we as followers of Christ have the Great Commission, Matthew 28, to go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And lo, Jesus says, I am with you always until end of the age. It's about people. It was Francis Chan who said, our greatest fear should not be the fear of failure but of succeeding at things in life that don't really matter. The gospel really, really matters. And on a side note, we read it here just a minute ago, the people had a mind to work. There was unity within the people. It goes without saying that, yes, our country is very polarized, we're very divided, But the church is very divided as well. And that will only hinder the work that God is doing. The people had a mind to work. It, it wasn't about their agenda. It was about the restorative work of the walls that would lead to the spiritual revival of the Jews. It is never about you or me. It's about what God has called us to do. Not about Calvary Midtown. Not about a church. It's about the work that God is doing in our city, in our community. What God is doing in and through you. God desires to use you. You just have to be willing. And I will admit that's scary sometimes. But it's also so encouraging to see God use you. Uh, there was a gentleman that I worked with who was, a, at the time, a self-proclaimed agnostic. Him and I would have some lengthy conversations. He began dating a gal who uh, was a little bit more involved in church than he was. So he began to go to church with her. It's a very structured church. And after he'd go to church with her, he would uh, follow up with me and say, I have a, a few questions for you. And we would have these conversations back and forth. Uh, I developed a fairly decent relationship with him. And 
Uh, one day he goes out of town and he says, hey, can you uh, take care of my dogs for me while I'm out of town? Sure, I can take care of your dogs for you, no problem. And when he came back, he said, hey, I'd like to take you and your wife out to dinner for, uh, on a Friday night. And I told my wife, he'd been dating this gal for a while, and I told my wife, I, I bet you he's going to ask me to do his wedding. Watch. And um, so we go out to uh, the dinner, and he says, hey, thanks for taking care of the dogs while we were gone, or the dog while we were gone. We're so grateful. And I um, and, uh, also had a question for you. And I was like, here it comes. Here it is. And sure enough, he said, um, I wanted to know if you'd be willing to do our wedding for us. We're getting married soon. And, you know, I'm, I'm squirming in my seat. And I was like, man, how am I going to get out of this one? And so I thought, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to lay this on absolutely thick. I'm going to lay this as thick as I possibly can. And I said to him, I said, hey, uh, I'm so thankful that you asked me, but uh, you got to understand where I come from. You know, if you want me to do this, this wedding, you got to understand that I, I, I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm going to talk about Jesus. And I'm going to talk about his death, his resurrection, the cross of Jesus Christ. I'm going to talk about your role as a husband that wants to honor God and lead your home and lead your wife in righteousness. I mean, I laid it on thick. I thought for sure he'd say, whoa, that's a little too much for me. Uh, we'll go ahead and pick someone else or maybe just go to the JP and... and uh, have our wedding ceremony there. Very much to my surprise, he responds and says, yeah, that's exactly what we want. And I looked at my wife and I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. Um, so I agreed to, uh, to do the wedding. And fast forward a little bit later, he said to me, you know, if you ever teach one day, he said, let me know and I'll, I'll be there. Oh, okay, you got it. So one day I was asked to teach at a small church in Mount Lemmon over the summer. My wife says, hey, did you invite so-and-so? And I said, he's not going to go and drive an hour up to Mount Lemmon in this small little church. It's like 20-some people. Uh, he's not going to want to go there. It's, 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 it's small. It's going to be awkward for him. And she, my wife says, hey, he said if you ever taught, let him know he would teach, or sorry, he would show up. I said, okay. So I texted him, hey, I don't know what you're doing this weekend, but uh, you mentioned if I ever taught, you'd come. Uh, I'm going to teach this weekend. Uh, you're welcome to come. He responded, I'll be there. He took his uh, fiance up there with him, and he actually showed up at this small little uh, church Bible study. The funny thing about it was he did, he did have a religious church background. I was very formal, so he showed up in a suit and tie. <laughs> and I showed up in a polo and jeans because it's Mount Lyman and it's you know, that, no, it's just nice up there. When we walked into the small church, they thought he was the speaker. <laughs> and not me. And so he had to tell everybody, no, I'm, it's this, this guy who couldn't even dress nice for your guys' this Bible study. I did his wedding. I had some great conversations with him about the Lord. Seeds were planted. God desires to use you no matter where you're at. We just have to be willing to say, okay, Lord. First, we must be people of prayer. Number two, we have to understand that God desires to use us. Number three, finally, we must also realize that we have an enemy. Look at verse seven. And now it happened when Sam, Balot, and Tobiah, and the Arabs, the Ashdites, the Amorites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the gaps were beginning to be closed that they became very angry. And they conspired together and attacked Jerusalem to create confusion. Note that, verse 9. Nevertheless, we made our prayer to our God. Because of them, we set watch against them day and night. And then Judah said, The strength of the laborers is failing. There is much rubbish that we're not able to build the wall. And our adversaries said they will neither know nor see anything till we come into the midst and kill them and cause the work to cease. For Nehemiah and the Jews, it was Sam Ballot and his friends. For you and for me, Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 6 that our battle is not against flesh and blood. But we have an enemy. And the enemy of our soul is a very real enemy who desires to do everything he can to disrupt the work of God in your life and to disrupt the work of God that he is doing through you. Again, he's been referred to as the enemy of your souls. 
Warren Wiersbe said, as long as the people in Jerusalem were content with their sad lot, the enemy left them alone. But when the Jews began to serve the Lord and bring, God, and bring glory to God's name, then he became, the enemy became active. Many in the church are content with their sad lot, unwilling to rise up, unwilling to be used by God. We have a very real enemy who desires to cause the work of God to cease. Jesus said that the enemy comes to kill and to steal and to destroy. He doesn't play fair. He doesn't play by the rules. He doesn't care about you. He doesn't care about your life. He doesn't care about your marriage. And he plays for keeps. And he will do everything he can to get you and to get me to shut up about our God. Sam Ballot and Tobiah begin to mock the Jews, their identity. So too the enemy will mock who you are in Christ often through the lie. You're always going to be this way. You're always going to struggle. You're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're not strong enough. You don't have what it takes. God won't forgive you. There's no end to this. You're too young. You're too old. But like Nehemiah, he reminded the Jews of who God is in verse 14. For the sake of time, we won't cover all of this. You can read it tonight if you'd like for homework. But Nehemiah stands on this, I get this picture on this elevated position, and he looks at the people and he gives this great speech to fight for your sons and your daughters and your wives and your homes. It's kind of this William Wallace type of picture because he reminds them that what you're fighting for is really, really worth fighting for. So he encourages them to take refuge and to take courage and to take confidence in God and to take comfort that God is for you. So we, you and I, must do the same. He shared truth, and truth is the most powerful thing. Winston Churchill, who said, truth is so important that it is often guarded by a bodyguard of lies. Jesus said in John 8, 32, if you know the truth, then the truth will set you free. He was referring to himself. What you're fighting for is really, really worth fighting for. He rallies the people together. He seeks the Lord. He realizes that they have an enemy. And then he strategically comes up with plans to come against the enemy. And lastly, and in closing, the goal of Sam Ballot and Tobiah and all the, all the enemies of the Jews was to create confusion for the Jews. And so too the enemy will do that with the church. Because he knows what happens when God's people come together. Powerful things happen. When God's people unite, powerful things happen. When God's people come together, powerful things happen. You and I were never meant to do this alone. You were never meant to be, quote, that, that lone ranger Christian. And I know that's a very antiquated analogy. But you and I were never meant to do this alone. We need each other. We need the body of Christ. We need those to come alongside us and to encourage us and to be there for us, to pray for us, to lift us up, to come alongside and to say, I'm with you in this. I'm walking this season of life with you. I am not going to leave you alone. I will walk with you. I will pray with you. I will encourage you. Let's come together. Let's see what God's going to do. We need each other. If we're going to maintain our focus we must remember that we need to be men and women of prayer, seeking the face of God, soaking into his presence. Remember that there's work that needs to be done, that God desires to use you. And remember that we have an enemy. But even Jesus says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen? Father, we thank you so much for this example of Nehemiah as he faces a difficult task of rebuilding the wall. Certainly some parallels in our world today. But Lord, the parallel is that we would be men and women who seek you in prayer, who seek your presence, who seek you. So Father, I pray that this morning that we would leave this place a little challenged this morning. Maybe we would take an opportunity to pray for each other, pray for the world around us. Lord, even as that 
I, I even admit it seems like a monumental task. I'm going to pray for my country and pray. Is it really going to change anything? Yes, Lord. Throughout the Psalms, we see David crying out to you. Hear, O Lord, his petition. We pray that you'd bring unity within the church, the body of Christ, that we would be that city on a hill that cannot be hidden, that we shine for you, that our lives would be such that we would point other people. So equip us for every single good work. Bless the work of our hands, the fruit of our labor. Lord, use us. We thank you for our time together. We give you the glory in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen.